As my 7 a.m. alarm went off, the sun came in through the blinds in my bedroom and woke me up quickly. I hit snooze and rolled over, doing everything I could to get one more hour of sleep before school started again. I was afraid of getting tired early in the morning, but I was also excited to learn. My name is Sam Richards, and I'm a student at Franklin High. I'm at the top of my class and want to become a doctor. I quickly did my morning tasks, grabbed an apple for breakfast, and ran outside to wait for the bus. Soon, Anna, my friend, showed up in her old Corolla, which was playing pop music like always. She laughed and asked, Need a ride, Einstein. She knew I hated being late. With a smile, I jumped in. In secret, I was glad to have company on what looked like a normal May Tuesday. As always, first period went by slowly. I carefully studied my notes in calculus, even though I had a hard time understanding the difficult equations written on the board. The freedom of the lunch bell finally came, and I hurried to the cafeteria to get something to eat. As I grabbed a tuna sandwich, I looked over the rows for a familiar face and saw Anna waving at me. As she ate her taco, we talked excitedly about prom dresses and made plans to go shopping this weekend. Too soon, it was time for biology, which is my favorite class, because Mrs. Wilson is so smart. She smiled at me as I walked into her lab and started teaching me about cellular respiration. I paid close attention to everything she said because I was interested in the complicated dance of molecules that kept life going. Suddenly, a sharp blare came from the speakers above to break the silence. Mrs. Wilson and the rest of the class stopped moving in shock. It said, lockdown protocol initiated in a robotic voice. Please follow emergency procedures. As students jumped off their stools in fear, chaos broke out. Chaos broke out. Calm down, everyone. Just like we practiced, Mrs. Wilson yelled over the noise. Right away, follow me to the storage closet. The chaos was calmed down by her authoritative voice, and we walked in a single line into the room without any windows. As she turned off the lights, we gathered together, barely able to breathe as screams and crashes could be heard from other parts of the building. The door to the classroom started to pound loudly and howls could be heard. As this live nightmare played out in front of me, my blood ran cold and I clung to Anna in fear. As Miss Wilson blocked the doorway with a heavy cabinet, she kept her steely determination. It wasn't a drill. Someone broke into our school and locked us in. It was like the thing on the other side knew exactly where we were hiding and was trying to break through. I held my breath because I was sure that each hit would break the wood into tiny pieces. Missons. Wilson stood firm and used her body weight to make the barrier stronger. More screams cut through the air, building up to a terrifying peak before stopping all of a sudden. There was silence in the school, which was much more disturbing than the noise before. After what seemed like an eternity, a few tentative sobs came from inside our small space. Is everyone okay? She spoke in a low voice into the darkness. A flood of yes answers came back, though some people were still scared. I saw that my hands were numb from holding Anna so tightly. She smiled at me, but her eyes were too far away to see it, as we sat in jail fearing every little sound that might mean bad things were going to happen. Time stopped having any meaning. Finally, there was a crackle from the intercom, and then an automated message said, lockdown has been lifted. All of the kids should go to the football field in a straight line to check out. We all let out a collective breath. Miss, Wilson slowly moved the cabinet out of the way with a scrape. Pale flashlight beams cast scary shadows on the ceiling of the empty classroom. Someone in the corner was throw up, which I heard. I'll check outside first, our teacher said in a soft voice. Stay close behind me and be calm and quiet. When she looked into the hall through the cracked door, she waved us out of the room. There was no sound except for our soft footsteps as we crept through the dark hallways in a single line. Moonlight came in through broken windows, making a trail of sparkling pieces on the floor. I fought the urge to look into every corner because I wasn't sure I was ready for what was inside. 
As we walked around the edge of the football field, SWAT team members led us to the stands where paramedics were waiting. Parents who were hurt crowded nearby and cried out in relief when they saw their children come out of the water unharmed. I looked around and saw some recognized faces, but there was no sign of the intruder. What had happened in those quiet moments after the beating stopped? I didn't think I'd ever get the whole story. When I finally got to see my parents again, I fell into their arms and started crying too. Their hug didn't erase the pictures that were burned into my mind. Horrors I saw or imagined during that never-ending siege. I knew it would be hard to fall asleep for a long time, if ever again. Unfortunately, the trauma of that terrible biology class wasn't over yet. It had just started to tear at my mind, long after the physical danger had passed. It wasn't like any other day, and I didn't think life would ever feel normal again. The days that followed went by quickly as I went about my daily tasks. I didn't get much sleep because I had dreams about faceless people banging on locked doors while I screamed in silence. I had dark bags under my eyes, but I didn't care about how I looked anymore. The local news couldn't stop talking about what happened, which they called the Franklin High Attack, and they looked at every single detail with a sick curiosity. I tuned out morbid gossip and clung to Anna's company instead, so we wouldn't have to talk about what was still bothering us. Since there was no school for a while, while cops looked for clues, we spent the afternoons at the mall acting like everything was fine. But now, there was a gap between us. A scar that no one could see that changed everything. Every look brought up an unsaid question. How do normal kids deal with facing pure evil? The students got together again in the sports stadium after a week. The administration stood firm in front of the stage, their tired, sad faces showing. The principal said, We had all been through terrible things, but unity and compassion would light our way forward. Details were given about how the criminal was caught and put in a hospital because he or she was labeled with schizophrenia. Even though justice had been done, there were still scars that therapy might help heal over time. I tried not to cry because I could relate to that soul's pain. Even though I was angry inside, why are we? When did the stars line up to put innocent lives in the path of madness? No answer came because none of them could calm us down. A memorial was revealed to honor those who died in the attack. The portraits of the brave people who died were a powerful reminder of how fragile life is. Before we were sent home, silent prayers were said to the sky. But even after school was over, there was still a heavy feeling of grief over the field where we used to play without caring. When school started up again after the summer, there was a sense of unease in the air. As part of the new security measures, cops were present 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and classroom doors had to be locked. These steps made people feel better, but they were also a constant reminder of the breach. My friends and I were cautious and easily startled by sudden noises. We had trouble concentrating in class because we kept having dissociative episodes that took us back to those scary hours when we were stuck like prey. Some people found that counseling helped them deal with their pain, but what could heal soul wounds? As the term went on in a detached blur, dark circles stayed under the reddened eyes. Functionality got a little better every week, but the gap between before and after could never be fully closed. Scars may fade over time, but the ghosts of trauma stay in the rooms of memory the longest, following victims long after the news stops talking about them. When I opened my eyes, I saw sunlight coming in through the open curtains. The familiar glow woke me up from another dream, a restless night with fits of sleep. I looked at the date on my phone with red eyes from studying late at night and stopped. The Franklin High attack happened a year ago today, has it really been that long since our lives were turned upside down by such violence? The sounds of beating and the chaos that surrounded our locked room slowly came back to me, just like they did every morning. As I shook my head and scrolled through social media, I saw sad tributes from alumni all over the world who had never been to our school, but shared our grief. It looked like people were still getting better from both physical and mental scars. I was thinking when I heard a loud buzzing sound. 
It was the first period bell, which rings every day, even when students are sad. When I got up, my legs were shaking, so I wore leggings and a big hoodie for warmth to face this big event. When I got downstairs, my mom hugged me tightly and wiped my tears away, before waving me off to face this demon one more time. It felt like I was walking into an eerie dream when I walked through the school's front door. Every corner was full of scary ghosts. I took deep, steady breaths the whole way to biology class, determined to respect Miss Wilson, who led us through hell. When I walked into her domain, she was gathering things and looking away. She didn't even notice me until I softly called out. When she hugged me, it was the first real sign that the pain she was still dealing with was still making her feel bad. We didn't say a word because we both knew what the other was going through. A PSD expert from outside our group joined us to help anyone who was having trouble with flashbacks or insomnia. His soft advice hit home, and it helped us remember that healing doesn't happen in a straight line, but that over time, we would become stronger. As slow progress took hold, days turned into weeks. I finished with honors, but I also felt sad because I missed people who had died too soon. There was a world outside of school that didn't stop at 10, 15 a.m. a year ago, and not many people in that world knew about our shared pain. But we survivors kept going, helped by ties of understanding that maybe outsiders could never understand. We wore our scars as a sign of what we had to go through. Today, I remember everyone who was hurt that day by using my pain to speak out. Talking to kids about mental health warning signs in schools helps more people understand how to spot problems early. Even though nightmares may never end, every life saved turns evil into something useful. It will take a lot longer for our community's spiritual wounds to fully heal than the physical scars. But by telling our stories of strength, we make a way for everyone who is suffering behind closed doors in the long night of the soul. Samantha pressed herself into the farthest spot behind the bathroom door and held her phone tight. Outside, announcements were muffled and echoed down the empty hallway, but she barely heard the vice principal because her heart was beating so fast. A lockdown, trapped, alone. She went to the bathroom in between classes to get away from the looks and comments that had been following her all morning. But now the squeaking faucet sounded like heavy footsteps coming up the stairs, and every swallow was too loud in the tense quiet. There was a shadow that went under the door. She tried not to cry as she desperately scrolled through her home screen with shaking fingers. Hi, Lauren. She had to tell Lauren. Sam typed a message in silence while her breath was shaking. The bathroom. Somebody is here. Not secure. Help. Send it. She could no longer do anything about it. In history class, two halls away, her only friend would have to understand without being told. Samantha put down her phone and tightened her grip on it to block out her terrified wheezing. Another shadow went by. This time, it's louder. That's it, not far enough. Through her tears, she begged in her head for the danger to end and for help to come before the door slammed shut. Samantha screamed, and the high-pitched sound kept bouncing off the tile walls as a huge figure walked through the door. She squished herself into the corner even more, pulling her knees up to her chest and putting her palms over her mouth, getting ready for the end. It didn't come, though. The figure laughed instead and threw its head back, a loud, scary laugh that echoed around the bathroom like crazy. Sam's heart stopped beating. There was no one there but a clown in front of her. It had a painted white face, an orange wig that was pulled back, a big red nose, and rouged cheeks that made its leer impossible to contain. In a rough rasp, it asked, Well, well, what do we have here? Another peal of crazy laughter, a little mouse that got lost and was by itself. What fun! It moved slowly forward, its big shoes scuffing against the dirty tile. Samantha had trouble breathing, and her nails were digging into her hands in a painful way. 
Even though her brain told her to run, she couldn't because she was so scared. This is not real. Clowns didn't exist, at least not in real life. But the painted face looked at her from closer in the dirty light, and she was sure it wasn't a dream. The heart pounding in her ears was cut off by a loud bang. When the door hit the wall, it scared both Samantha and the clown, backlit like an angry angel. Lauren stood there with Vice Principal Smith and two armed police officers on either side of her. Get away from her, Sarah screamed. The clown let out another scary laugh and took a step backwards with his hands up to show that he was giving up. Even with the grease paint on, its eyes never left Samantha's. They were cold and soulless. This isn't over, little mouse. It hissed as it split, but the police jumped in and dragged it down the hallway, where it could be heard laughing hysterically. Samantha was curled up and shaking, and her lungs were gasping for air, as if she had just come to the top after a long fight underwater. Lauren ran to her side, close enough to touch, but not too close, and whispered that the danger was over. It was too hard for Samantha to answer. She kept hearing the clown's words over and over in her head. It's not over yet. It was only the beginning of her horror. The police car pulled away, leaving the bound clown and his partner behind the wall in eerie silence. Samantha didn't calm down until the beast's brake lights went out around the turn, finally blocking her view of them. As the sun went down, she stood there shaking, Lauren's arm around her shoulders, giving her comfort. Vice Principal Smith told them that the school was safe and that the threat was over for now. However, Samantha felt a deeper sense of dread building in her bones. Officer Dunn took off the clown's makeup at the station with stream after stream of wet wipes, showing normal boys behind the masks. Samantha almost gasped out loud when she saw that Matt and Jordan were teenagers who'd been grounded last month for damaging Mr. Leonard's car. Of course, the teacher would also lie about this. In the clean observation room, she sat there with a stone face while Matt spit out, swear words, and Lauren squeezed her hands tightly. When asked a question, Jordan shrugged and smiled across the two-way mirror. Teach. It was just a senior joke. There was no harm done, right? That's not right, Detective Morales said, leaning forward closely. Similar pranks played on two young girls last Halloween left them needing medical help. Boys, you could be charged with a crime. This time, real years in jail. Matt turned pale and didn't say anything. I saw Jordan throw up his hands. Hey, Matt came up with the idea. You know, I just went along with it. I don't want to get hard time. We'll see about reducing your charges for full cooperation, said Morales. Start talking. All of it came out when Matt was threatened with jail. He said that he was angry at that Miller bitch for getting him suspended and jokingly suggested that as payback, they should dress up as clowns and freak everyone out because he was bored. Jordan went along with it. He didn't mean any harm. She shook so hard that her teeth were chattering. Lauren's eyes across the glass were filled with uncontrollable anger. She was mad at Samantha the boys who had broken the school's safety rules, and all the girls who had been truly scared because of these spoiled brats' weird sense of fun. When the conversation was over, Morales walked out of the room, looking happy. Well done, you two. I'll get back to you about court dates. Samantha and Lauren slowly stood up to leave, but the officer grabbed their arms. How are things going for you? I can't understand what they did. Samantha looked at her worn-out boots and didn't know what to say. The terrible things that happened that day were like a pit opening in her stomach. She didn't think she'd ever feel safe again. That night, Samantha's stomach was full of heavy, greasy food while her folks talked in hushed, worried tones. Clearly not dealing well. School transfer might be best. Samantha didn't pay attention and kept turning the charm on her bracelet around and around its worn grooves. She couldn't stop thinking about clownish leers in the dark and the uncomfortable pit that had moved into her belly ever since. She couldn't get away from these scary thoughts. But maybe, just maybe, she could start to heal in a new place where there aren't any ghosts. 
Matt and Jordan were kicked out of school by a majority vote of the board, but Principal Leonard seemed unhappy about the decision. The boys were thought to be mistaken pranksters, not monsters, by people in the town. But Samantha knew what was really going on behind the cold eyes and fake smiles. A week later, she stood in the hallway under a tap that was steadily dripping. She counted the leaks to break away from her feelings of sadness. She spun around as a locker slammed behind her, her heart racing to her mouth. But it was only Lauren, with a sad smile and a cardboard box. I got you a transfer to my school, Lauren told her politely. It's a fresh start, away from, all this. Samantha gave a grateful nod and tucked a loose hair behind her ear with shaky hands. A new start sounded like the way out. That night, Samantha packed in silence while her parents agreed downstairs. The choice had been made, and she was hoping that this new school would fill the dark holes that worry had left in her. Samantha kept her chin down as Lauren told her to on her first day at Lauren's school, even though her stomach was turning. There were whispers following her, but Lauren's steadying arm made her feel stronger. There might not be ghosts around every corner here. Therapy worked for some. Nice Dr. Ashley taught people with panic attacks how to breathe steadily, but Samantha still woke up most nights screaming and leering grins and crazy laughter could be heard echoing down empty hallways. Lauren never grumbled about the many calls she got late at night. She just listened until Samantha's fast breathing stopped. During this hard time, their bond grew into the loyalty of sisters. Months went by in a blur. Samantha went to class without thinking and didn't eat much. Her jokes didn't land and dark circles started to form under her eyes. It felt like the pit inside her was going to swallow her whole. In February, police officer Morales knocked on the door with his hat on. She said softly, the boys took a plea deal. Five years, possibly less with good behavior. Samantha quietly nodded feeling a mix of fear and relief. The threat was taken away, and justice was done. Still, memories stuck with her like ghosts, following her around when she was awake and showing up in her dreams. Could she ever feel whole again? Even though it was spring, Samantha was still numb and lost in her thoughts. Then, on a Monday, Lauren grabbed her hands and looked at her with bright eyes. Please come with me to the school dance tonight. Forget about the past. Samantha wasn't sure what to do and looked around at the many pictures with a Halloween masquerade theme. It was too much with all the costumes and masks that smiled. Her smile, on the other hand, gave her hope that joy could be found in the dark. At night, Samantha fixed a domino mask with sequins that Lauren had given her in front of the bathroom mirror. Pop music played softly from the gym behind the painted walls letting everyone know that the dance was in full swing. She took a deep breath to calm down. You were able to do this. For Lauren, take back your life. You will no longer let fear rule you. She struggled with the mask's stretchy strap with her shaking hands before she was able to secure it in place. As Samantha left the room, she saw Lauren smiling at her from the hallway. You look great. Are you ready to blow up this popsicle stand now? I've heard that the punch is great. Samantha laughed softly, even though her stomach was tight with worry. Everything would be fine as long as Lauren was with her. They walked into the busy gym together, which was decorated in bright purples and oranges. Teenagers in costumes laughed and spun on the dance floor, which had scary lighting. A matched pair of skeletons walked by and winked at me. Samantha jerked, but she calmed down by taking a deep breath. They are not real. They are just outfits. This place is safe for you. With a cheer, Lauren pulled her toward the lunch table and grabbed cups from a volunteer werewolf who was grinning. Sam drank the fruit punch and let its sour sweetness calm her down. She said, this is fun, as she watched a zombie horde dance to Thriller across the gym. Masks and costumes turned into a sea of smiles around her as the night went on. No one could judge the girl who used to freeze in the dark because of her domino mask. Sam's lungs felt free for the first time in over a year. It was like 
air. During a slow song, Lauren winked at her and pulled her onto the dance floor. It's time for your first real dance. Since, well, you know, don't keep dwelling on the past. Samantha nervously grabbed Lauren's hands, but didn't say anything. She swayed gently to the beat while orange lights flickered. Slowly, carefully, step by step, the holes that fear had made in you filled with warmth again. Samantha realized with growing awe that she was now ready to let go of the past and welcome the bright future that was just waiting to happen. As the last song played, Lauren said she would get them party favors and then slipped into the crowd. Under the moving kaleidoscope lights and paper banners, Samantha smiled back at her. A shadow moved in front of her and she turned around with a racing heart. But it was just a skull mask grinning as it quickly said sorry and blended back into the crowd. Samantha took a deep breath and relaxed her muscles. It was fine. She was fine. After that, Lauren gave her a tight hug at the gym doors. I'm so proud of you for facing your fears in that way. I know no one's stronger than you. Samantha smiled. The October sky was getting darker, but she felt lighter than she had in years. People used to say that what didn't kill you made you better. As she stood here with the mask in her hand, she knew for sure that her nightmares were over. The long path to recovery was over. She could easily shape her bright future that stretched out in front of her. It was another Monday morning, and Ted was sweeping up a mess of streamers and balloons in the school cafeteria. The graduating seniors must have had quite the party last night, celebrating the end of their high school careers. Ted didn't mind the extra work. It kept him busy during his shift as the school janitor. As he piled up the last of the colorful debris, Ted heard the heavy double doors swing open behind him. He turned to greet whoever had entered but froze when he saw the woman standing there. A large hunting knife gripped tightly in her hand. Nobody! Move! She screamed, brandishing the knife wildly. The few remaining students in the cafeteria gasped and huddled together against the far wall in terror. Ted instinctively ducked behind the lunch counter, his broom still in hand, peering over the edge cautiously. He took in the scene unfolding before him. The woman was strikingly disheveled, with tangled hair and wild eyes that darted around the room frantically. I know you're in here, she growled. I saw your car in the parking lot. I'm not leaving until I find you, you son of a bitch. Ted wondered who this deranged woman could possibly be looking for. His gaze flickered over to the cowering students, taking in their frightened faces. Among them was Todd, a shy freshman boy who often helped Ted tidy up after school. Todd was trembling so violently, he looked ready to pass out. Ted knew he had to do something to help distract this woman before she hurt someone. But what? Just then, Principal Walker emerged from his office, having heard the commotion. Miss, I'm going to have to ask you to put down the knife. Why don't we go talk to the police instead, he said in a calm voice, hands raised passively. The woman spun around to face him, eyes blazing. You're not him, she yelled. With a primal scream of rage, she lunged forward and plunged the knife into Principal Walker's gut. He let out a gasp of shock and fell to his knees before slumping over on the floor. Panic erupted as students began screaming and scrambling to get away. The woman yanked the knife free and brandished it at the fleeing crowd. Nobody leave. I'll gut every single one of you if you don't tell me where he is. Ted's mind raced as the gravity of the situation sank in. This woman was now a murderer and had made it clear she wouldn't hesitate to kill again. He had to come up with a plan, and fast, before any of the students were next. Looking around frantically, his eyes landed on the large janitorial closet across the room. An idea started to form. The woman began prowling up and down the rows of tables, pausing every so often to peer under them with a crazed gleam in her eyes. I know you're all hiding something from me, she hissed. Tell me where he is, or I'll gut every last one of you. No answers came. 
just muffled whimpers as the huddled students tried to squeeze themselves into the smallest targets possible. Ted's mind reeled as he watched, still pressed against the back of the closet with Todd trembling at his side. Through a crack in the door, Ted caught glimpses of the woman's unpredictable movements. Each pass brought her closer to their hiding place, and he knew it was only a matter of time before she discovered them. But fleeing was not an option with an armed psychopath on the prowl. He'd have to figure out some way to draw her attention long enough for help to arrive. A glint of light caught Ted's eye, reflecting off the woman's knife as she prowled by again. The blade looked bitingly sharp, and it sent a chill through him as he imagined how easily it could end a life. What demons were raging inside this woman to drive her to such violence? Ted's memories flickered back to his days, serving overseas, to dark scenes he'd spent years trying to forget, the chaos and carnage of the battlefield. Good men cut down in their prime. Even now, he sometimes woke screaming from nightmares about sand and blood. A shuffling sound brought Ted back to the present as Todd slid further down the wall, his breathing growing ragged. The boy was having a panic attack on the brink of a breakdown. Ted grabbed his shoulders firmly. Hey, look at me, kid, he said in a low but steady tone. Take slow, deep breaths. You're gonna be all right. I promise. Todd nodded shakily and focused on regulating his breathing as instructed. Ted gave him an encouraging smile before turning back to the crack in the door, where the woman had now stopped to mutter angrily to herself. Her nonsensical ramblings hinted at a troubled past, but gave no clues to her real target. A sudden crash from outside made both Todd and Ted jump. The woman whirled around to face the closet, knife raised as if she knew they were there. Ted's hand closed around a folded metal chair leaning nearby, ready to use it as a weapon if needed. But after a tense moment of silence, muffled shouts drifted in from the hallway, followed by the wail of approaching sirens. Reinforcements were here at last, and their luck might finally be turning. But would they arrive in time? And would the woman's unpredictable rage lead her to take a hostage or attack someone else in her desperation to evade capture? Ted steeled himself as best he could, clutching the chair tighter. The next few minutes could mean the difference between life and a horrific death. All they could do now was wait and pray. Help made it in time to end the nightmare. The sounds of shouting and running feet grew closer outside the closet. Ted held his breath, watching through the crack as the woman paced back and forth in agitation. Her muttering had turned to curses as the police approached, punctuated with wild swings of the knife that had the remaining students flinching back against the wall. Ted's grip tightened on the chair, ready to burst from the closet if needed to draw her attention from the terrified kids. Don't move! Put down the weapon! A booming voice echoed from outside, followed by a slam as the cafeteria doors were kicked open. The woman let out an animalistic roar of rage and spun to face the police storming into the room. Back away from the students now, the lead officer had his gun trained on her steadily, flanked by two others with tasers at the ready. For a tense moment, nobody moved. The woman and police at an unstable standoff. Ted held his breath, willing her not to do anything rash that would endanger innocent lives. But her betrayal and madness had driven her past reason. With a feral scream, the woman charged at the officers, knife flashing in a deadly arc. They opened fire instantly, three shots piercing her body in brutal succession. Her momentum carried her a few more steps before she crumpled to the ground, crimson pooling beneath her still form. A collective sob of relief escaped the huddled students as the threat was eliminated. Paramedics flooded in to tend to any injuries while police cordoned off the scene. Ted slumped back against the wall, drained both mentally and physically by the harrowing ordeal. It was over. They had survived the slaughter, though the shocking images would no doubt haunt them for years to come. Ted brushed a tear from his cheek, feeling the weight of tragedy keenly once more. So much senseless loss of life. And for what? 
Revenge born of madness would only breed more darkness. A soft knock sounded from outside the closet, followed by the worried face of Officer Jackson peering in. You boys okay in here, he asked gently, taking in their shaken states. Ted nodded, finding his voice. We're all right now. Thanks to you folks. Get these kids somewhere safe, would you? And call an ambulance, the principal. His voice broke as the crumpled form flashed before his eyes once more. So much death, all to stop one deranged woman's twisted pursuit of a phantom enemy. As the students were let out with comforting arms around their shoulders, Ted gathered Todd close in a protecting hug. It's over, kid. You're safe now. Let's get you looked at, yeah? Todd nodded silently, still in shock. As they exited the blood-splattered cafeteria at last, the hidden horrors they had witnessed would stay with Ted for years to come. Scars of the mind were deeper than any flesh wound. But for now, he took solace in the fact that through courage and sacrifice, more innocent lives had been spared from the madness of that terrible day. Ted sat on the bench overlooking the school football field, watching the fading sunlight gild the edges of gathering storm clouds. It had been five years since that dreadful day, but the memories still surfaced regularly to torture his dreams. So much had changed in the aftermath. The school was temporarily closed for repairs and counseling, its inhabitants scarred in unseen ways. The board called for increased security and mental health screenings, in light of such violence penetrating their once idyllic halls. Police investigations pieced together the tragic backstory of the assailant, a downward spiral ending in homicidal madness. Revenge against a former boyfriend had driven her to insanity and mass murder, destroying innocent lives in the process. Her name was best left unspoken and forgotten, her memory cursed. As for the survivors, each coped in their own way with the trauma. Todd went on to finish high school with the support of friends and family, though his easy smile was forever dimmed. The students who witnessed their principal's brutal stabbing sought counseling for years. Some never fully healed, but Ted's wounds cut the deepest physically and mentally. Though hailed a hero for his quick thinking under pressure, Inside, he felt only guilt for failing to save Principal Walker from the attacker's rage. His service overseas had already inflicted wounds, and this fresh horror was the tipping point that sent Ted spiraling into PSD. Nightmares plagued his sleep for months on end, to the point of exhaustion and illness. Loud noises or crowds sent him into panic attacks that stripped away all sense of safety. He lost his job as janitor, Unable to function amidst reminders of that terrible day, therapy and medication provided some relief, but the scars remained deeply embedded in his psyche. For a long time, Ted withdrew from life, haunted by ghosts that mocked his every move. Sleep was a dangerous venture into traumatic memories, while waking brought none of the comforts extinguished by his condition. Existence seemed a bleak, unbearable half-life mere steps from the abyss. But slowly, with the loving support of his family, Ted began to surface again. He rekindled relationships left neglected during the darkest times. Walks in the countryside replaced the busy social triggers that overwhelmed him. Simple pleasures like gardening and cooking gave structure and calm to every day. It took perseverance, but over the years, the rough edges smoothed from Ted's trauma. Nightmares faded to sporadic incidents, then disappeared altogether. He was able to re-enter crowds and travel once more without distress. Counseling continued to help process repressed emotions and achieve acceptance. So here, Ted found himself on this golden autumn afternoon, free of the shadows that once ruled his existence. He smiled fondly as students laughed in the distance, their joy and lightness of spirit a healing balm. Though ghosts lingered in the corners of his mind, Ted had triumphed over darkness through courage and community. The sunset's brilliant hues reminded him that even in life's deepest trials, beauty could emerge if one simply had faith to see it. Ted's scars would remain, 
a reminder of survival, but no longer defined his days. All in all, it wasn't a bad place to be after enduring hell. His healing was complete at last, and that was surely worth celebrating.